All right, let's see. Hey, all right, it works, cool. All right, so we're going to get started just a few minutes early, catch some of the stragglers as they kind of come in, but I see these are the last survivors of GERCON 2015. All right, guys, having a good time? Right on, right on. So how many people here are uh, not still new, but are from the first time people that came? Awesome, right on, okay. All right, so uh, before we get started, I was putting this thing together and I'm kind of like, all right, I don't know if I'm going to maybe uh, piss some of the wrong people off, and especially since it's kind of going online. So I figured, all right, let's just add a couple uh, disclaimers. And with all legal things, I figured let's make it as small as possible. So uh, by continuing to listen and or watch this presentation, you agree that this information is for informational purposes only, not to use any content provided for any legal purpose, will not sue or pursue any civil discourse based on the knowledge shared with Within against myself or Gurkhan. Uh, I wasn't going to mention them, so all right, yeah. Disclaimer two, uh, <laughs> the views and opinions expressed in the following content may or may not be that of myself, Gurkhan, or those who I have or will ever work for. <laughs> and then the third one, uh, try to keep an open mind. Uh, there's probably things that, depending on where your slant is, it might go contrary to your viewpoint. Uh, with that in mind, we're going to try to keep politics out of this as much as possible. And uh, no rioting, because I'll probably not be asked to come back as a speaker ever again, and that would suck. So, all right, so let's get started. Um, setting the stage. So I use this long title that sounds like I should be wearing like a monocle and like have a wine glass in my hand, but um, what are we talking about when we're talking about uh, safety and you know, stuff? So um, the background behind this is I had an interesting dad. Uh, he, in his hobby, he liked to look at cycles in history and say, all right, what happened before? Because chances are it's going to happen again. And back in the early 2000s, he tells me randomly out of the blue, there's going to be a crash in 2008. I'm like, what? Whatever, man. And then he starts telling me a, bit, a little bit more about it. And then I'm thinking, all right, well, what if that does actually happen? First, I'm going to feel like an idiot if I knew about this like five years beforehand. I don't do anything about it. You know, world, end of the world comes. But that, the thought was, all right, what could potentially happen? Am I prepared? And this is more or less like a culmination of that knowledge. And I've kind of continued since because the re reality of it is our world is fragile and we take a lot of things for granted. So uh, two things I want you guys to kind of take apart or take away from this. First is what relevance does this information have to you? How can you really apply it? It's one thing to see something and say, oh, this one thing could happen. But when you take it internally and realize, all right, does this apply to me or not? I think it just makes it real on a whole other level. And then second, uh, what can you do about it, about some of the stuff that I'm sharing and apply it? So, so if you don't know, you're not safe, believe it or not. So, and uh, on that note, we're going to, man, not even a laugh, really? Do you guys know who this is? <laughs> Good golly, all right, man, I at least hope for at least a laugh. Okay, so, all right. So on that note, we're going to dive right into probably the, one of the most controversial topics. Oh, wait, not yet. Yeah, I'm like a couple slides ahead of myself. All right, so. Uh, you want to know a few few facts here. Uh, what do you guys think the average time is for uh, for a mugging and attack to take place? Like once it starts, someone comes at you. How long do you guys think that takes? Wow, I didn't even hear. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty seconds. Ten <laughs> ten seconds. <laughs> Holy crap! That's like the fastest attack in the world. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, it's actually 30 to 60 seconds is where a clock's in it. Um, I've seen some people argue at 90 seconds, but you know what? Uh, that's, we, we get the idea right. It's a very small, small period of time. I don't know if it comes down to something where we see in movies where someone's attacked and, you know, it's like a five minute scene or, uh, you know, your adrenaline is just pumping. So every second feels like an eternity. But in reality, it's, you're looking between 30 and 60 seconds. What do you think the average police response time is? Her hour. Four hours or four minutes. <laughs> Someone's joking about Grand Rapids being different. <laughs> yeah, or Detroit, yeah. Or Flint is probably like two days, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> four hours? Wow, four hours. All right, so the national average is 10 minutes. Yeah, the best time was four minutes for the entire nation. It was really weird when I'm reading this report and it said they were applauding this town for having like a nine minute response time, and I'm going, Wow, that really sucks. So let's put the PCs together. So you get attacked, it's like 30 to 60 seconds. 
assuming that as soon as it starts, someone's calling that in, you've got to wait, what, another nine minutes? Let's just call it three minutes just to be, you know, we got the best police officers in the world. What are you going to do during that time period? Maybe you're already dead. You know, maybe you're bleeding and dying. You really don't want to rely on the police to take care of you because that's not their job. The end of the day is someone commits a crime, they're there to dispense justice. Take that person who's committed that crime to jail. They're not there, they're not your personal bodyguard and take a bullet. I'm sure they care about people, but they've got lives and families too. So relying on them is a false sense of security. We're going to jump right into something highly controversial on that point, which brings us to the next point. <laughs> Which, by the way, isn't it ridiculous? I cannot believe this. I heard a story on the way up here where a friend of mine, her kid got in trouble. They had a, you know, a garden at home, and they've got like peppers and stuff like that that they, they grow. Well, her kid brings this pepper to school, having fun with it with one of his buddies. They know what it is. His buddy eats it. He starts going, oh, my gosh, it's a pepper, you know, watering. He's like, he needs water. He's kind of freaking out about it. Next thing you know, the kid who brought the pepper to school gets, uh, you know, gets a detention. Yet the kid who put it in his mouth and bit it, you know, obviously knew what he was doing. But that just seems so messed up to me. It's, it's so backwards. So, anyways, back on point. Yeah. All right. So let's make this simple about guns. All right. Good guys have guns. Bad guys have guns. A balance of power. You remove that from the good guys and the bad guys have power. It's simple. It's history. Look back through all time. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Second point, making them illegal doesn't work. <laughs> All right, so uh, more, more reasons why uh, we can argue this case. So if you're a guy, let's say we're bad guys, and we got guns, and we want to inflict the most amount of harm and damage to some place, where would you target? I'm actually surprised how many people are giving me feedback. I expect maybe one or two people. Now I can't hear everybody because it's like, yeah, no, no, no. All right, great. Um, yeah, so all, all these places. But what it really comes down to is places that have gun-free zones. Let's go back to the thought. Is it, let's say, four, nine, or we'll, we'll go back to the concept. All right, it's a 10-minute average across the nation. If I have means, uh, if I have a desire to harm and hurt people, I want to know where can I go that I'm not going to get hurt back or I've got the most amount of time to maximize the damage that I want to do to a bunch of people? Go where there's not legally guns allowed. Schools, movie theaters, we get the idea. All right. I was doing a little bit more research on this. I encourage you to check out more about this because uh, I haven't completely validated it, but, you know, I mean, it's USA Today commentary. It must be legit. Uh, but they're basically saying that every mass shooting since 1950 except for two happened in gun-free zones. It's kind of messed up. You'd think we'd kind of get the clue maybe 50, 60 years later. So, All right, and then last argument. I always had a difficult one with this trying to explain to people, why do I, why, why do I carry a gun? Why do I have a gun? Because my thought was, well, if someone's in danger, well, I can help them or protect myself. But it's common sense, man. Yeah, it's not like you're expecting to get attacked. But, uh, yeah, you're not expecting to have a fire, so you're going to run around. You still have a fire extinguisher just in case. I'm like, that's the best argument I've ever heard. So like if you agree. All right, so CPLs and CCWs. Uh, I want to touch on this briefly because I feel like there's this common misconception and we kind of mix terminologies. If I go up to a police officer, I don't want to say I've got a CCW because in their mind, that's also the same term that they use for if someone's, you know, legally, or it doesn't matter if legally, you're legally carrying a concealed weapon, they use the same thing. So if you've got a permit and you want to talk about getting a permit, I encourage people to use like a concealed pistols license um, terminology with that. So. Uh, more statistics regarding, um, currently in Michigan, this is how many people in the state of Michigan have license to carry concealed. About 480,000, and the graph is showing from October 14th to October 15th, or 2015, 14, 15, uh, how many licenses are currently out there. Did the, some numbers, we got about 9.91 million people in Michigan as of 2014. Uh, if I calculated this right, it comes out to about 4.84% or about 1 in 20 people have concealed carry licenses. It's kind of weird if you think about it. There's hundreds of people in here. I think there's hundreds. Whatever. we got a bunch of people in here. But around you every day, you're, you're passing people on the highway, in work, all this stuff. And you don't realize that 1 in 20 of those people, if, if not less or greater, you know, variable, have licenses to carry. You're actually surrounded by guns and you don't even realize it. I was trying to figure out why there's this fear and this facade of, you know, 
uh, you know, guns and, and, and I, I think what it comes down to is, uh, movies and entertainment have so, uh, amplified it and made it such like a, like a hyped up thing. You know, someone's like diving through walls, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. And it, it increases, it causes like this adrenaline, uh, uh, response in us. And I think that's what happens now when, you know, you see something in the real world, you kind of tie in and clue into that. Couldn't find the statistic. I remember this from years ago, and I think it was from an FBI study, but believe it or not, people that have these licenses and do carry it concealed are 12 times less likely to commit a crime. The main reason or argument behind that for why this is the case is that people who carry go through, uh, you, you gotta consider why you're, if you're carrying, if I'm carrying a gun on me, I gotta figure I'm gonna have to use that someday. If I'm gonna use it, it means I'm gonna have to shoot somebody, and that means the chances are I'm gonna kill somebody. If you're not ready to do that, don't carry a gun. If you're not ready to do that, in the heat of the moment, you pull a gun on somebody who's hurting somebody, if, if you're not ready to react, that person can take from that gun from you, you become a victim, the people around you become victims. So, a lot of psychological stuff that goes on there. But, don't take my opinion for it, you know, I, I like this, uh, this is from 2014, there we have a, uh, a police officer who is sharing his opinion to join the police force, uh, in Detroit. Let's see, I hope this works. Hey, <laughs> I know, right? Maybe? Yay! See, I like to test stuff beforehand. But in my view, you know, when we look at our good community members uh, that have concealed weapons, uh, there's a greater likelihood in the city of Detroit that they shoot. And part of the thought behind that, again, this is when I was coming in the door, is a uh, lack or absence of confidence in this police department. That we would get there, that we would investigate and do the kind of job that we're sworn to do. With a legal gun, guys trying to rob him, he shoots, shoots him. Does that really help you guys? Hurt well, you, you know, I guess I have my education in the great state of Maine. You know, Maine has a model, the way life should be. And I think I was caught by a surprise coming from California where it was, I mean, concealed weapon permits at that time, it was an act of Congress to get one. Police chiefs just did not author or, or give approval for that. So I go to Maine and there's stacks of, you know, uh, CCWs and I was denying them because that's my orientation. But what's interesting about Maine, uh, lots of concealed weapons permit. My orientation changed very quickly. But here was the key with Maine, one of the safest places in America. One of the safest places in America, and it's not like crime is non-existent. Certainly in Portland, Maine, they had gangs, they had narcotic suspects, they had shootings. Uh, but clearly, suspects knew that good Americans were armed. To him saying it, it's a little more legit, right? He's got a badge, you know. This guy on, guy on a stage with a microphone. All right, so I think we've kind of beaten to death the uh, the whole gun thing. So why don't we, uh, why don't we go into... Uh, a different target. <laughs> yeah, I think you guys know where this is going. All right, so uh, <laughs> this comes down to security theater. We're led to believe that these guys seeing this awesomely posed picture look all serious like once we get through them, we're going to be completely safe. Which, by the way, I'm sure our tax dollars paid for this photo op, this awesome, scary-looking woman on the left, right, and all that. So. But let's be honest here, let's just stick with the facts and our personal biases, right? Because, let's be honest, we get a little jaded and we get angry and we throw our personal opinions in. So let's just look at the facts. And based on that, we're just going to point out how ineffective they are. I pulled this from an article, you'll see that where, where I pulled it from at the end, but it says a recent security audit found that the TSA has failed to find fake explosives and weapons in 96% of covert tests. 96%. And members of the Congress familiar with the classified details say the body scanners are to blame for much of the problem. Well, last time I checked, I think most of the mechanisms that they use at the TSA are the body scanners. So, yeah, all right. So, Repub uh, Representative Benny Thompson of Mississippi, the top Democrat of the 
uh, I can't read, on the House Homeland Security Committee said that while the TSA has spent a fortune on new equipment, he is troubled about their capa uh, capability to detect and prevent dangerous materials from passing through security checkpoints. I'd be a little concerned too, especially with a 96% failure rate. Come on, really? All right, well, it gets worse. So Johnson says that while the bomb detection is obviously a complex undertaking, these things weren't even catching metal. Here's the messed up part. This is pulled from Political August 2015, not two months ago. So are we led to believe that ever since 2008, when they start implement, implementing these systems up until now, they're not even picking up metal? Uh, that's kind of messed up. And we just thought, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm just kind of blown away with this the information. I, I really didn't know what to do with it when I, when I first read that. So all right, let's kind of keep going. Because, you know, cost, maybe they just don't have enough funding, right? They just need more money. So I wanted to go through and figure out all right, how much money have they actually spent on these scanners? Because they've, believe it or not, they've actually been completely replaced several times. And we start back in 2008 where they deployed about 45 machines at about $150,000 each. Came around like something, six million, whatever. And another time period between this time and I think 2010, they spent another $73 million throwing out more devices. But don't worry, they used their stimulus money to stimulate the economy somehow to put more of these systems in. Then in 2010, they replaced another 500 of these, spending another $88 million. Uh, of course, these are completely safe, right? You know, their images aren't, you know, accessible. Nonsense, never. You know, there's no health risks. Next thing you know, whatever, they replaced them again in 2012. I couldn't find the exact specifications for, you know, what, how much money they, they spent in 2012 to replace that stuff. Uh, but, yeah, now they're asking for another $160 million to replace all the equipment because of this latest thing in August that, whatever, got released. But only $120 million is going for more scanners. But don't worry, they're not running out of money because it turns out that their annual budget is $7.9 billion. What? I was thinking about that. I'm like, you know, with the people that we got here at Gurkhan, I can guarantee you we'd probably better safely secure all the airports in the, in the nation for like half a billion dollars. So what the hell are they doing with this other money? Because they're obviously not using it for training. I, I just don't get it. It just amazes me. Uh, this might account for part of it. Huffington Post, 2012, of May. This actually was reported from several news sources. I just happened to pick these because, you know, whatever, I picked political in the last one. I don't know. So they said thousands of pieces of security equipment that cost taxpayers an estimated $184 million and were supposed to be installed at an airport checkpoints uh, to screen passengers were found to be collecting dust in a government warehouse. A joint congressional panel reported this. So this is not like, you know, Joe Blow saying, hey, there's a bunch of stuff here. This is officially reported stuff. So I'm just thinking, this is just, this is insane. It's like, they obviously have no budgetary stuff that they know what they're doing. I mean, just, this is just stupid. No consistency, right? When was the last time you went to the airport and you just brought something through? Um, you realized later, oh, I didn't realize, realize I even had this in the bag, in my bag. Um, it always seems that it, it comes to whoever's at the scanners or at the, at the, at the gate. The metrics change. You know, I, I couldn't believe it. One time I had a, uh, what, what's the limit? It's like, what, three ounces still or something for water, right? Or, or for liquids? Well, I had a, a giant Nalgene bottle that was clearly marked on the side as to what the ounces were. And I had like nothing in it. And I would go through the airport and the guy goes, you can't take this through. I'm like, why? It's clearly, obviously I have like less than three ounces of fluid in here. It's like, oh, but the bottle can hold more. I'm like, well, no shit, but there's obviously it says it's less than three ounces. So what's the big deal? It's just unbelievable. I'm just, what? And then another time, I've taken the same Nalgene bottle through, filled complete with water, never even stopped. I'm just like, this is crazy. It's like every airport just has different things. It's like, do, do they care? They just roll dice? Uh, one time, I actually took a, a, a wooden hanger with me through, uh, you know, whatever for my, for my clothes or whatever, and somehow it got busted on the trip. So I figured, all right, I'm going to have a real problem getting back through the, uh, you know, the airline going home because I've got this, this sharp object busted up metal, a wooden hanger. Nobody even said a thing. And I'm just thinking, wow, this is crazy. How many objects can we take through that aren't on the approved list that we can use as weapons? It's kind of ridiculous. So I, that's why I say, it, well, I think we all agree. It puts us more at risk. You know, 
I'm not, even, I'm not even saying that we got to worry about like you know a, a gun shooting happening in the middle of like Detroit Metro Airport where people are diving over walls and this and that. What happens if a, a, if a, something happens, a plane accidentally runs into the building, or something happens where people are trapped? If I don't even have like a pocket knife on me, you know, how am I going to do first aid, medical type stuff for other people if I don't even have the bare necessities to take care of others? It's just a disaster waiting to happen. So I kind of go back to theory. Why do we even have this stuff, right? And I'd say, kind of come up, I think, base theory is this. You kind of give people the idea of used to um, using this stuff to feel like you're safe. Because obviously we've shown it's not effective, right? 96% failure rate. So uh, I take this one step farther, and I, I kind of think it's the idea is not only to get people comfortable with it, but keep it in there long enough, and people just assume it's acceptable and, and won't even want to change. Think about the kids these days. Everybody grows up with an iPad and all this stuff, and you can't even imagine life before technology. Same idea. Give it another 10 years. Our kids, well, I don't have kids, but your kids, um, are just going to assume that the TSA has always been there, and it's an acceptable thing for me to what, whatever get strip searched or whatever in order for me to be safe. Then there's no more challenges. I'd say most of us probably put up with it because we need to, to, you know, to get to conferences, to go along with our daily lives. Which kind of takes me to this really cool quote that surfaced on a tweet in, uh, during all the Greek stuff kind of going on, you know. And this person basically says, in Greece we have an expression, nothing is, nothing is more permanent than the temporary. I felt like there was so much in those few words. Because if you don't say we got an end date of when this is going to stop, it just keeps going. You get mad about this stuff going on, but oh, it's just temporary. It's, it's just for a little while. All right, fine. You get mad again. Come on, let's stop this stuff. It's just a temporary solution. There's no end. And that's really what we're stuck in. I see that constantly happening again and again. But there's at least some hope to avoid the scanners. You can opt out. And this is actually something I do all the time. I don't know how many people actually realize this, but I go to the TSA, start walking through the line, and I'm watching. Are they sending me to the metal detector? That actually is probably going to catch metal if I had it. Or the, uh, the scanner device. And if I see they're going to send me through the scanner, I get up there and I'm like, all right, I'm going to opt out. And again, it depends on the airport if I got to wait, you know, a minute or two or whatever. But they'll call somebody over, send me through the side, just do the hand on the back thing. And I'm like, sweet, see you later. That's it. I guess it's my little way of... I don't know, protesting or whatever, but at least the fact that they got to touch me up and down, I'm sure it doesn't make them too happy. So, uh, whatever. Give it to the man. So. All right. So we're going to jump from there to civil services. And when I'm talking about civil services, we're going to focus on, uh, we're talking about water, gas, electricity, sewage, waste services, and internet. So I'm talking about the core things that we have in our everyday life that we've always had and just assume they're always going to be there. You know, I, I think it's become a buzzword now. We're talking about SCADA systems and all that. But, yeah, same thing. So, it's obvious. They're extremely vulnerable. But have you really considered the impacts in society if any of these things were going to kind of go bad? And I want to make a really quick note on this. Um, in the event an uh, electromagnetic pulse were to go off, whether from nuclear or whatever, in the United States, it would take about 50 years to rebuild the basic infrastructure. Now I'm not talking about your refrigerators or you know your, your power to your house and you know central air. I'm talking about the, the, the central substations that transmit power from one area to the other. The reason why is because if, if my uh, if my hardware goes down or, or breaks, well I need something to build it. But if that's busted, I need something to build the thing that just busted to build the build. You know you get the idea. It's this chain reaction and we wouldn't be able to manufacture these replacement parts for the substations. We'd have to have somebody build it overseas, have it shipped here, have it then sent to the place and then installed. And that life cycle or whatever, just for that, would take about 50 years. Kind of crazy. So uh, why would these things happen? Uh, break it down about three things. Attack. So imagine we're talking about these different things. And... You guys might be coming after me, or I might, I might be coming after you. We're two warring states. And let's say we're in a stalemate. Your forces are looking at me, I'm looking at you guys. Well, if I can go in and do any kind of disruptions, 
whether it's the elect electricity or maybe I just go in and this, do the sewage. I back up all the sewage so people's houses are not flooded with this filth and disgusting stuff. Let's say it gets into the water supply. Well, now you got to deal with pissed off citizens that are going, what the heck's going on? So now your, for your focus is diverted. you got to watch your people and make sure they're happy while you've also got the threat of me coming after you. Or if you don't even know that I'm coming, all your focus is now on these, you know, on your citizens trying to make them happy and I can come in and take you over even better. What if we chain that? What if I do something where uh, your sewage backs up, but then I disable your electricity or gas so you no longer have the ability for people to boil the water to make it clean again? <laughs> now you're really in trouble. And internet, yeah, I guess all the kids would be like, oh, our internet's down. Nobody would know what to do, right? So besides attack, we, we can still look at natural disasters. Things happen all the time that we can't control. You know, and then also oopses. I'm sure that's never happened. Nobody's run a, something into a tree or taken out stuff, you know. But the idea is to think about these things, that they're possible, they can happen, and what would happen to you? Are you do, would you even know what to do if any of those things went down for an extended period of time? All right, so uh, this is another fun little thing. So who's familiar with what a distribution chain is or how it works? Okay, a few, and they're like, yeah. Okay, all right, so when we're talking about distribution chains, the idea is, what we're looking at here is, um, let's say, I don't know, everybody likes, likes Coke or Pepsi or something, I'm sure, whatever. So let's say Coca-Cola manufactures some Coke, yeah, okay, Coke at their plant, and they got to get it to you. So the idea with the distribution chain is, all right, so manufacturer buys it, or, man, gosh, yeah, they make it, a warehouse buys it, it gets shipped to them, and then that warehouse then sends it to the store. So that's kind of like the idea is that this distribution chain from you as an end consumer to the manufacturer originally. And we went with the idea where um, if I want to buy something, I buy in bulk. So let's say I'm going to buy noodles. I would say I need 200 boxes of noodles. And now in Meyer's warehouse, they've got, or at the store, they've got 200 boxes of noodles sitting there. Well, if suddenly some health report comes out that says noodles are bad for you, well, nobody's going to buy those noodles. Now I've got to sit on them. They're going to sit there. They're going to go bad, and they're just going to kind of, you know, go to waste. Well, Walmart came around, and we kind of went into this new age where they created something called, I believe it's called just-in-time delivery or shipping, and the concept is every single store holds no more food or supplies than it needs but for, for three days. So they have three days of milk, three days of cereal, Three days of whatever. Because if I keep selling it, I don't have to worry about spoilage. You know, I can keep my profits, you know, at a high because I don't have to worry about stuff getting, uh, you know, run out. If, if something goes out of style, I can replace it really quick. Uh, but that leads to problems. Lots of problems. So a uh, good example would be, <laughs> when's the last time a big snowstorm came through? I can't believe they actually call it snowmageddon or whatever. You'd think they'd never seen snow before, but this happens. Something happens, people start freaking out, and all the store shelves start going bare. All right, sure. Let's say you're that guy, and you're like, okay, I need to go and buy up everything to hole up for this, this snowstorm that's coming. Well, what do you do if you hold out, you hold out, but now your supplies are gone? You're like, okay, I need to go more, go buy more at the store. Well, it's been more than three days. People have already been hoarding and, you know, buying everything, so... I can't buy food at the store. <laughs> what are you going to do? What happens if, uh, yeah, sure, a snowstorm comes, so maybe a, a bridge or something goes down so that no longer the trucks can come in to resupply those store shelves? Do you even think about that? Or you just assume that there's always going to be food or you're going to be able to get supplies if you need it? So why am I kind of going into all this? I'm saying, oh, this is bad, this is bad, you know, whatever. World's falling apart, but the, the end goal here is uh, what I really want you to look at is uh, being prepared, thinking these things through, and having a game plan <laughs> of how to react if things don't go your way. So, and th this is part of the reason why I'm talking to you guys is I say that one of the first keys is empowering other people to take control of them, or take care of themselves. Biggest uh, proponent for that would be. Who do you think is a greater threat? The guy who's prepared or the guy that's unprepared? Unprepared? Yeah, exactly. If I've got food and you don't, and you're starving, you got nothing to lose. 
you're going to come after me, and chances are you'd be willing to die or kill me just for a chance of survival. The guy who's prepared, chances are, even if I hated him before, the things went bad, now we're going to be BFFs because he's ready, I'm ready, and if there's a threat, chances are we can help each other out. Something you also want to consider, too, general populace and how they're going to react around you where you live. It's going to be different. Different situations call for different things, and I really don't like this idea of how we just generalize everybody, that they're idiots, they're just going to oh, go out blindly, you know, act like a... I don't know, mindless, crazy horde. Yeah, sure, some places are like that. Um, you run into this concept called the 10-80-10 rule, which I really like. And it talks about how, in a crisis, 10 people are going to run towards safety, 10 people are going to run directly into danger, and the rest of the 80 people in the middle are going to follow one or the other. You obviously want to be the part of the 10% that is, is running towards safety. And part of that is pre pre preparing yourself and thinking these things through mentally. Good example, Katrina and the Sports Dome. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys even really followed that too much or, or remember, but a whole lot of people were like uh, listening to uh, the government about going to a place. Oh, come here. You'll be safe. We'll take care of you, give you food, water, and shelter. Well, they go to this place, get locked in. They run out of food, water, and all the basic necessities. They're more or less abandoned. Nobody can get to them. And it turned into a huge t catastrophe. I'd say that's probably like the 80, part of the 80% in the middle. I don't know how many people uh, were really affected by that. I, I didn't even know if people really died. I just, it was just so bad. I just was like, you know what? Yeah. All right, here's what's really weird. I'm talking about cannibalism now. So if, if you're not familiar with this, your body can survive for, I think it's three days without water and 21 days without food. But when we say 21 days without food, we're talking you're dead. Not as in, oh, I really need like a Kit Kat bar. We're talking like you are freaking dead. If you look through history, it doesn't matter how advanced a civilization is. Once you hit about 12 to 14 days, that civilization will turn to cannibalism. I guess we just turned uh, zombies from fictional to kind of reality here. So, uh, you know, you're, you're, you got your food, you're good to go. Your neighbor runs out of food. Um, it's kind of weird to think that they're going to, try to eat each other and maybe you just to like kind of survive. It's kind of a trippy thought, you know, but it's true. All right, so first thing we need to do is have a strategy, have a game plan here. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a lot of fun with, uh, with, the, with this kind of class training thing I went to. They were um, wanting people to uh, learn how to do project management. And we're in a group of a whole bunch of people, and we're talking uh, people are in their 60s, 50s, 40s, a whole gambit. you got people, office workers, you know, men, women. And my table consisted of, you know, a lady, I think she's probably in her mid-50s, gray hair, you know, a couple other random people. And they're, they tell everybody in their, at, their, at their table to, okay, come up with a, um, a project that you want to build. Some lady says, oh, yeah, we want to plan a birthday party for our 8-year-old. Uh, somebody else says, let's build a garden. Some other person says, oh, let's plan my wedding. I just turn to my table and I'm like, zombie survival apocalypse planning. And they did it. It was actually a lot of fun. We ended up spending the, like, the next hour going through filling this uh, uh, project change template. And it was awesome because we we're figuring out things like, all right, who's actually going to be included in this? Who's outside of scope? We, we figured the instructors were outside of the scope of who we were going to save. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, it, it was great because we're talk they covered everything and... Uh, I guarantee in their normal life, they really never would have thought of this, but uh, I've never seen something so formally written up. But I mean, we cover everything from like risk, deliverables. Uh, the scope of it was we figured, all right, we're not going to care about what happens after a year after the zombie apocalypse starts, but from the day it happens, we want to figure out how to survive from there up to one year. So it was a lot of fun. So how can you and I look at this and figure out, all right, what, what do we do? First thing is play a little what if. If you start, until you start thinking these things out and what could possibly happen, you're not really going to know um, how to prepare for it. And end of the day is you can't prepare for everything. If you do try, you're going to look like those, you know, those crazy prepper guys on TV, you know, warehouse and bunkers full of stuff, and they can't even have a normal conversation. Maybe it's because they were trying to think this stuff through, through too much. So inside your strategy, the first thing you really want to figure out is where to go, and it's going to be different for every scenario. And chilling out in your basement hiding is not a good solution. Actually, I can't think of anything that's, that, that, any situation that's really kind of a good idea. What's that? Tornado. Well, 
Damn it. Yes. Okay. Tornadoes. Hide in your basement. <laughs> Unless there's sharks. I don't know if that would change things up, but. <laughs> All right. So after you figure out where you're going to go, <laughs> you want to figure out how you're going to get there. Is it foot, uh, bike, skateboard? I mean, you really got to think these things through because I guarantee you saying, oh, it's a bad, let's get in your car. Or everybody's thinking the exact same thing. You're going to be stuck in with them. Just thinking things, these, thinking these things out makes all the difference in the world. One really cool, uh, uh, I don't know if I should give this away because now everybody's probably going to start doing it, but, um, well, I guess they started doing it in The Walking Dead, so we can cover it, but, um, these guys talked about how if you really need to get around or get from city to city, don't use the main highways because they're going to be covered, you know, with people that are freaking out just getting in their cars. It's going to be lots of obstacles and you can't really see very far, but train tracks. If I need to get from city A to city B, perfect. You're with a couple people, one guy's up there, maybe, you know, like five yards, second guy's back on the other side. You know, you basically spread out, you've got good coverage. If you sense danger, everybody just kind of hides. Uh, but your path is really clear. You're not really going to be uh, challenged too much. But I don't know, after, you know, The Walking Dead, and, you know, who knows, everybody might start doing that now. So uh, items you're going to need. And I actually place that farther down on the list. But before we start figuring out what we want to buy, really, nobody's laughing at that? Would you like a bag for your stuff? No, I'll just hold everything in my pocket. Oh, come on, guys. Maybe we should have blown it up bigger. OK. All right, so gear. I love these guys. And they're actually not morons. They're actually retired military guys. They'll actually go through and review gear. And everything from backpacks to you know, I think, I'm thinking to even go to weapons and all that, but it's a great place to find out what actually works and what doesn't, because nowadays you buy everything online, and uh, it, it's nice to know that there's people going out there trying this stuff, because I hate getting a backpack or something that, you know, doesn't really work, doesn't fit, and they really break things down. Uh, Pack specifically, I love this company. I don't know how you, if you pronounce it Kifaru, Kifaru, or something, but uh, they make their packs 100% American-made, uh, again, ex-military guys that have been in the field, they know what works, what doesn't. Uh, they make incredible stuff, and it's the most durable stuff I've, I've ever run into. Uh, on the note of packs, difference between a bug-out bag and a go bag. You might have heard this in different terms as well. There's, they call them uh, get-out-of-dodge bags or go-to-hell bags. I mean, the, the gist, it's the same concept. I break it down to the difference being a bug-out bag is something that's big enough to hold enough supplies for you for 72 hours to get from where you're at to whatever rally point or, you know, if it's your, let's say you're at work, right? And I don't know, something happens. Uh, you got to get home. Well, that bug out bag should have enough supplies so that you can get home within 72 hours if you can't get by car or whatever. It's just enough to, to get you by. Where your go bag is your long-term pack that's got everything to get to your long-term destination. What's kind of cool is if you do your setup right, you can actually attach your bug out bag to your go bag. So if you really need to drop your stuff and run, you just drop it, grab your little bag and go. Uh, kind of using the example on the left of what a bug out bag would look like, and then your right is your go bag. Um, I picked that pick, most bug out bags, which are on the left, are actually tend to be a little bit smaller. Uh, but I like this one specifically because of, of the color. This color is uh, foliage. And I like it because it looks like pretty standard pack. Not only does it blend in well if you're out in the wild or in the woods, but if I've got to go into an urban environment, that looks like a standard pack that, you know, somebody could be doing, you know, some camping with it. Uh, if I'm in that city and I'm running out of supplies and I see some people that could be potential targets, if I see these two guys walking, you know, maybe a little bit apart, but I got to choose between these two guys, which one do you think I'd rather go for? Because I think he's got more supplies or he might actually have more expensive gear. Yeah, I'd go with the guy on the right, too. I mean, he's got some kind of camo there. It looks like, oh, he must have some kind of cool tactical stuff. I should target him. Uh, obviously, well, in this case, the pack's bigger, so he's obviously going to run slower. But um, the, the left just looks like a standard backpack, you know? So after that, this is start when I, I go into the coolest of all the, of the things that you might want to start hoarding in the event of something happens. And uh, again, I couldn't really find the original source because this is something that I ran into in the early 2000s. Uh, but I think this list was compiled based off of uh, information from the Sarajevo War and some survivors, and they really uh, went through 
what disappeared first, and actually even some priorities. And, uh, you know, I actually do have all 100 on here, but I think we would start losing our minds if we started going through everything. But I want to have it up in here so you can look at it, because when I started collecting stuff that I thought would be important to me, uh, or, or it would be valuable to a lot of people, it was very different than what I actually saw on, the, on this list. And um, I don't know if you can read this, but generators, not really a good idea. Yeah, sweet for power, but if you want to start broadcasting your attention or people's attention that you're there uh, and attract zombies, you know, you don't want to use those. I expected batteries to be one of the top items on here, but it actually made about number 38 on this list. Uh, actually, and even weapons. Weapons made it to number 7 on the list, and I expected that to be higher, too. Uh, what would surprise me is if you actually got, like, honey and thing, syrup sweet things at, like, number 8. So, or 9. Yes. All right, 9. And then you got things like, what, vegetable oil, survival guidebook at 17. Um, yeah, washboards and mop bucket ringer at level, uh, level 20. Number 20. I don't know the last time somebody's done laundry manually, at least in the past couple of decades. At least I haven't. So, so you got more uh, garbage bags, 29. All right, so I'm not going to go through all of these here. Uh, duct tape, 53. That surprised me too. I expected it to be a little bit higher. Use duct tape for anything. Eh, more reading glasses. Yeah, okay. All right, and then you get the last 10 here. But if you want to check this out, do more detailed reading, uh, that's the URL. What's that? Oh, I, no, no, okay, all right. Nobody's making a comment. All right, yeah, what surprised me too was ghosts and chickens were like number 100. Huh? Am I missing something? No, oh, <laughs> dude, those would be like, like number two for you, right? <laughs> number one, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, pink nightmare. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, if you want to check it out, there is actually even more commentary uh, about some of these survivors and what they say, what's really important. Like, they point out the fact that um, no matter how, uh, the longer war drags out, the less and less gold actually has luster and value to people, and they will trade anything for, you know, decent humanitarian, humanitarian items like toilet paper and, you know, cologne, and just things to make you feel like a human again, so... So, all right, so we talked about a lot of stuff regarding, you know, oh, I need this, but we've never really talked about kind of high-tech stuff. You know, I'm talking about basic survival stuff, but let's be honest, we're a bunch of nerds. We like tech. I think we'd lose our minds if we're stuck in a situation where we had to survive and we didn't have a single piece of computer hardware to play with. So, so just a couple things I wanted to, to touch with that because, in, in truth, there's no way to say, all right, yeah, you need this, you need that. All this stuff we're talking about is specialized for your situation where you want to go. So anybody that tells you, you know, buy this kit, it's got everything you need, don't believe it. You're just getting generic stuff. That doesn't mean it's what you need. So a couple things to consider. What, what kind of equipment do you, do you really need it? You don't want to be carrying like a 20-pound laptop in your bag that's got like a two-hour charge on it. That's just going to... That's going to suck. I'd say just don't even worry about it. So consider the types of stuff you're taking with you. Maybe it's not going to be portable. Maybe it's going to be stationary. Think about this stuff. How are you going to power it? If you say I'm going to do solar, well, and you're on the move, now you got to add solar panels to your pack. This stuff adds up. Believe it or not, this stuff gets really heavy really fast. I think, it, I remember hearing about 160 pounds is the maximum weight uh, a male adult in his prime should probably be carrying on his back. Anything more, you're going to have run into serious you know, back problems uh, for carrying. Packing and protecting it, all right, yeah, how are you, you going to store it? You know, you just want to throw it in your bag, you know, get banged up. But shielding, that's something that at least I think about. You know, the reason I haven't bought a Kindle yet is because I haven't run into one that's got EMP shielding on it. The last thing I want to do is load all my books on I start reading, and then something goes out and I lose all my books, you know. Give me a hard copy. Um, you don't have to spend thousands of dollars uh, on EMP shielding, also known as like Faraday cages. There's a concept known as poor man's Faraday shielding where... Uh, a good example would be, let's say for some reason you think your cell phone is going to be necessary or helpful after the end of the world, you put it in a Ziploc bag, then you wrap it with aluminum foil completely so there's no gaps, then you put it in another Ziploc bag, aluminum foil again, and you do it one more time so you've got about three layers of Ziploc bags and aluminum foil, and the theory is that it should deflect enough of a, of a, of a burst going off that it won't fry your electronical components inside of that. 
downside to that is obviously you can't use it because it's inside all this stuff. And if you keep opening it, closing it, you know, it's, it, it starts breaking down and wearing. So you can kind of, before things go bad, you keep it all sealed up and ready to go. After things go bad, all right, now you access it. Then we get into comms. And it's another thing that we don't really, I don't think people think about. How many times has something happened where a disaster happens and you try to contact somebody else and you don't, you can't get through? All circuits are busy. Things are overloaded. I'm looking for two suggestions here on reliable comms that you think you could use to contact somebody or maybe the people, your loved ones, in the events of an emergency where you just need to, you know, get a hold of people. Ham radio. Carrier pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, someone might eat it, you know. <laughs> uh, all right, so the second one, actually, uh, yeah, hand wave, what's up? Five minutes, dude, really? Uh, all right, all right, so uh, ham radio. Uh, I'm curious to know, too, in the event of an EMP blast going off, how that would affect transmissions for the ham radio, because I know it does some atmospheric bouncing sometimes and, and all that. But secondary to that, believe it or not, I actually call satellite. There's no ground stations. It's all atmospheric. I'm not a physicist, so I don't know actually know how EMP or electromagnetic fields, you know, go outside, you know, once, how they work once they hit, go outside of the atmosphere. But I figured these guys putting these satellites up there probably designed these things to, you know, have enough shielding to, you know, protect them from these things. Sure, you kind of need some specialized equipment typically, but if you check back to this Wired article that happened back in 2009, this is actually a really big deal, where uh, back in Brazil, all these citizens found out a way where they could, you know, jack on to the, you know, FLT SATCOM a military, you know, U.S. military satellites that didn't use encryption at all to start communicating with each other. So, uh, and they were able to do this with about $100 worth of spare parts tying it into their car radios. You could actually go to a shop, have a non-technical guy say, all right, well, here's your radio, loop a bunch of, you know, you know, uh, copper wire together. It shifts it to that frequency, and now you can communicate directly to that satellite, and it relays it down, and anybody else listening, you can communicate with each other. I like that, too, because if my equipment goes fries or goes bad, you know, I can build another one. And I guarantee if a bunch of non-technical people back in 2009 can put this together for less than 100 bucks, what do you think a bunch of hackers can do? So, all right, and then, um, all right, so one more last thing I want to kind of uh, leave with you guys, then. Uh, just remember this, no matter how much of a badass you think you are on your own, you know, you can kind of pull it off your ramble. There's no, you know, there's no comparison to strengths and numbers. Your survivability is going to go through the roof just by having one extra guy with you. You can't keep awake 100% of the time. You can't watch your back 100% of the time. So, yeah, your ultimate dream team right there. So, all right, thanks, guys. So, um, any questions? Yeah, I know. It's it's incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> it's kind of like I threw that in there. And I mean, not only that, but I'm like, how do I follow up with that one? So, all right, guys, thank you so much.